What's up guys? Uh, my name is Tim Iaria. Uh, again, um, this is another video I'm bringing to you, my own personal sort of video blog type thing on uh, unsung professional wrestling eras. Um, again, not dealing with the golden era of, you know, the 50s and 60s, the breakthrough on television, Gorgeous George, uh, Buddy Rogers and all that. We're not talking about that. Obviously, that was huge for pro wrestling, everybody wearing suits, you know, adults only going out on a Friday night watching the shows. We're not talking about the rock and wrestling uh, era of Hulk Hogan, MTV, WrestleMania 1, obviously the biggest boom, Vince McMahon going national, killing the territories. And we're not talking about the Attitude Era, obviously probably the most money-making um, era of pro wrestling, Stone Cold Steve Austin, The Rock, Triple H, Degeneration X, all that stuff, the Monday Night Wars. Uh, in these couple of videos that I've been doing, I already did WWF 1992, and, uh, WCW 1992, my bad, and WWF 1994. These are all um, eras that I love to watch on the WWE Network, times that, I, you know, specific uh, years or, um, you know, uh, you know, segments of time that I like to go and watch either, you know, if they had weekly episodic television, you know, like, a, you know, Monday Night Raw or pay-per-views, you know, like, um, that they would have, you know, back in those eras, 92, 94, they were only doing, you know, maybe four pay-per-views a month or something like that. But today I want to talk about another great one that gets slept on a little bit, and that's ECW around the middle of 1995. Uh, May, around May of 1995 in ECW. Um, before that, ECW was very local, very regional. Um, by this time, they were already into the hardcore aspect of it, the blood and guts, the chairs, the tables, um, you know, fire, thumbtacks, all that, uh, which was totally different from basically everything WWF and WCW were doing at the time. Um, WWF obviously being the king of the hill, um, you know, and in 1995, again, everything was very sticky, cartoony, still very much like a Saturday morning cartoon. You had the, the garbage man fighting the plumber. And in WCW, um, in the early 90s to mid 90s, uh, let's say at this time, 95, they already probably had Hulk Hogan and Randy Macho Man Savage and were trying to gain some traction, but still weren't really there yet as a national power. They were more as a, a Southern thing. Now, ECW, me, again, being a Jersey Shore guy, um, growing up in New Jersey, um, 70 miles to Manhattan and 50 miles to Philadelphia, we got everything. We got all the stuff on TV, um, including ECW. I used to stay up late. I think it, ECW was on, I remember like Thursdays, Thursday nights on some like weirdo public access channel at like 10 o'clock at night. Um, and it was sort of hard to find. And again, this was pre-internet. You know, if it wasn't on your uh, 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 TV guide channel, you know, you couldn't find it. But I want to look at, like I said, some stuff. ECW, middle of 1995. Okay, so we're coming off of, you know, the, uh, in the previous months before that, Again, and they weren't having pay-per-views. There were no pay-per-views uh, at the time at ECW, but there were super cards and stuff like that. And I, I don't have any notes. I don't have anything written down. I'm just basically on the Wikipedia here. Can't really probably see it because of my, my screen or whatever. But uh, I'm basically just opening up Wikipedia, looking through these things and kind of shooting from the hip. I don't have anything written down. Um, I probably could have and should have done a little bit more of you know planning and stuff like that, but I wanted this to come off as just basically like we were talking in my garage, which is what we are, um, you know, just two buddies discussing it, you know, kind of like a podcast type deal or whatever. Okay, so anyway, 1995 in ECW, April, May, you know, we're talking about, you had guys like Chris Benoit and Dean Malenko still in ECW. This was right before um, they would both basically go over to WCW and sort of start the cruiserweight um, division over there. And, you know, obviously Chris Benoit would go on to become a uh, multi-time world champion in WWF and uh, WCW and Dean Malenko, you know, probably one of the greatest workers of all time. Um, you had, you know, matches like Cactus Jack versus Terry Funk uh, in your main events and stuff like that. I want to look at May 13th, 1995, one of their supercars was called Enter the Sandman. This was the first, uh, this was the first show that I really, you know, if I'm starting in this era where I like to start and start watching uh, as far as if, if I were going to go sequentially, 
you know, uh, with uh, ECW shows and stuff like that. Okay, you had 911 was still there. 911, a big giant monster guy. Um, probably not one of the greatest workers of all time, but he was definitely uh, a big imposing guy and, uh, you know, was a, was a good character at the time. They sort of needed that big monster guy. Taz was still the Taz maniac. Everybody knows Taz as the, uh, the shooter, the beat me if you can survive if I let you, or, you know, he went on to sort of famously be a commentator for a long time. But this was back when he was still the Taz maniac. His gimmick was sort of a, a jungle uh, guy, almost like a Tarzan um, type, you know, leopard print and face paint and no shoes and stuff like that. So it's funny to see uh, such an accomplished guy like that um, in this, this other gimmick that he uh, was, was uh, working. Um, Axel Rotten versus Ian Rotten is on this card. Another great blood feud. Two guys that, uh, you know, I think they, they both owned and operated uh, their own sort of local promotion. I'm, I'm pretty sure uh, Ian Rotten maybe had something like that. I don't think they were actual brothers. Um, but in a barbed wire baseball bat, barbed wire chair match. Okay, it doesn't get much more ECW than that. Uh, those guys really had a lot of good uh, hardcore fights. I think they had like uh, glass fist matches like in blood sport where you dip your fist in the honey and broken glass and stuff like that um raven and stevie richards uh beat mikey whipwreck and tommy dreamer i always liked the the raven and tommy dreamer feud um was probably their main feud in ecw the, the main feud in ecw that was essentially the superman versus lex luther the, the you know tommy dreamer was sort of the face of the company and raven was sort of the uh Antithesis, you know, the, the, the top heel of the company. Tommy Dreamer, I don't think, ever got a win over Raven until like their very last match, which would come probably like five or six years after this. And I know he was mad about it. Paulie sort of wanted to keep, always, always have Raven win and never let Tommy Dreamer, uh, you know, get a win over him. But then I think they ended up having to towards the end of their career. And you can see here Raven and Stevie Richards, who had Beulah in their corner. Um, this was, I guess, before she jumped to Tommy and did the whole storyline where she was pregnant and stuff. One of my favorite matches of all time, and this is why I like to talk about this pay-per-view, you had Eddie Guerrero as the television champion wrestling Dean Malenko to a 30-minute time limit draw. I talked about it in maybe my WCW video. Uh, these are the types of matches that I love to watch. Any sort of chain wrestling between two lightweight to middleweight type guys again my favorites being rob van dam versus jerry lynn never had a bad match eddie guerrero versus dean malenko you'll never see those guys have a bad match you know sort of same along you know lance storm versus chris jericho Shawn michaels versus marty Jannetty. dudes that know two dudes that really know how to work flip flopping and flying all around the ring uh, for each other and this is classic ecw having them go the 30 minute um time limit they did a lot of stuff like that with these two guys really letting them showcase their skills they used to do two out of three fall matches, I think, where Eddie would win one, Dean would win one, and then they'd pin each other, or they would draw and stuff like that. Always a good time to watch those. In this pay-per-view, you had Sandman as the ECW champion beating Cactus Jack. I was never, I saw ECW live a bunch of times. I got to go to the ECW arena um, in Philadelphia, I think 1998, 1999, uh, back when Rob Van Dam was still there, Dudley Boys were there, Tommy Dreamer, Rob Van Dam, Sabu, uh, New Jack, Mike Awesome, all those, all the big main heavy hitter guys. When you think about that late era, ECW were there. I was never a huge Sandman fan. Um, I get the character, I, you know, the, with the America sh flag pants and you know the, just the T-shirt, and he had like you know regular shoes on. Um, he really didn't. He wasn't a, an Eddie Guerrero or a Dean Malenko. I get the that you needed a guy. He was sort of the Stone Cold before Stone Cold. He would smoke a cigarette and drink beer and just basically hit people with a cane, but. Um, they, they pushed him as their big baby face. I think he was a multi-time world champ, and he had the title for a long time. He beats Cactus Jack here for the title. Could Cactus Jack or should Cactus Jack have been the ECW champion? Yeah, I can see. You know, he was sort of the king of hardcore. They made him the first hardcore champion. King of the death matches, Cactus Jack, obviously. He probably could have and should have gotten a, a, an ECW title reign. In my opinion, he was a better worker than Sandman, but that's just who they pushed. Um, they also had on this card uh, Eddie Guerrero beating Marty Jannetty. Again, Marty Jannetty is one of my favorite wrestlers um, for the television title. Uh, maybe that was sort of a dark match or something like that. It's on the Wikipedia. I can't, I, I, I can't remember if that, you know, I can't prove it, but it seems like it was there. And um, again, two guys that are great at chain wrestling and, uh, you know, probably a very good styles to clash against each other. Um, 
This also has Sandman versus Shane Douglas. Shane Douglas, I loved as the franchise character, as the top heel champion of the company. I thought they did a very good run with that. Uh, he had a good feud with Taz in there. I think Taz was the guy that took the title off of him. But uh, this was pre-Shane Douglas being, you know, the, the main player that he was. I think this was probably right as soon as he was coming back from uh, WWF as well when he had done the Dean Douglas run and sort of got buried by the click and stuff. Um, you had the public enemy beating the Pitbulls in this. Uh, the Pitbulls... Uh, yeah, both of those great, you know, Public Enemy gets a lot of uh, flack on the internet. They got famously beat up by the APA and sort of run out of the WWF. And the Pitbulls, um, I think one of them has passed away. I think both Public Enemy guys have passed away. Maybe one of the Pitbulls has passed away since. Um, but those guys, as far as tag team wrestling back in the day, they were sort of the beginners of how to do hardcore wrestling well. Public Enemy was sort of the first people to um, introduce tables. They were the first guys really to bring tables to WCW, you know, along with Sabu. Um, it's to bring, breaking, putting people through tables on a national stage, um, as opposed to, you know, the Terry Funk trying to put Ric Flair through the table, which I think was the first table spot in pro wrestling after one of those, you know, Starcades or Clash of the Champions or whatever, which started the, uh, Ric Flair and Terry Funk feud. Um, so again, a lot of good talent here. Uh, Shane Douglas, not where he was, you know, not, you know, still sort of catching up. Um, Tommy Dreamer, still sort of not the top face of the company yet, but uh, working on it. Um, and again, all of these basically took place in Pennsylvania too, which is funny, you know. Uh, the following Super Show after this May 13th was called uh, Barbed Wire Hoodies and Choke Slams. Okay, and um, this was a... Uh, June of 1995 here. And again, we got a couple of people that you never, you know, you don't really hear about a lot, the Broad Street Bully. Um, Broad Street Bully uh, also went by Hitman Tony Stetson. I don't really remember a lot about him. He was, you know, probably not much of a, you know, didn't do a lot to write home about. Um, you also got Val Puccio, who lost to um, Mikey Whipwreck on this next card. I don't really remember him. Okay, they had Vampire Warrior wrestling in ECW at the time. If you look at this, Vampire Warrior, um, very popularly known as Gangrel. Um, that was his gimmick. I think he was doing it in Mexico and stuff like that at the time. Uh, he beats a guy named Hack Myers. Hack Myers also no longer with us. Um, he was sort of a mainstay back in those early ECW days as well. Um, Luna Vashon here with Tommy Dreamer. Tommy Dreamer actually gets a win over Vampire Warrior in this as well. Um, so you can see, I don't remember Luna Vachon being with Tommy Dreamer much, uh, but she sort of bounced around between all the promotions and stuff like that. She didn't really get her comeuppance in WCW. I think they brought her into WCW to, flu to feud with Medusa after Medusa had jumped, done the Alundra Blaze thing, went back to WCW. I think they brought Luna in to do some stuff with her, but I don't know if they just didn't get along or they didn't like each other or they couldn't work out um, how they wanted to run the matches. Uh, Jungle Jim Steele is on this uh, pay-per-view as well, also known by Wolf Hawkfield. Um, don't remember a lot about him, but he gets squashed by 911. 911 famously came out, and I'm pretty sure he just choke slam. He would just come out and choke slam a dude, and that would be the end of the match. Um, Two Cold Scorpio, another guy I wanted to talk about. Two Cold Scorpio is one of my favorite pro wrestlers of all time. Trained in the New Japan Dojo, I think alongside Chris Benoit at the time. Uh, Two Cold Scorpio made sort of made his debut stateside in WCW early WCW days you know they had him teamed up with Marcus Bagwell won the title there famously got fired from WCW for smoking too much pot uh, I know he used to smoke a lot of pot in the parking lots and with the WCW or the ECW guys and stuff like that um, I think he was the finalist against Shane Douglas when they did the when Shane Douglas threw the the Eastern Championship wrestling title down and uh, sort of started the whole ECW Extreme Championship Wrestling thing. But Scorpio, I always thought, was a great athlete for a big dude. He you know, could fly around and do a lot of flips and stuff like that. He probably could have and should have gotten a bigger push in WWF. They brought him in to do the Flash Funk gimmick where he was like a pimp or something like that. And then he sort of just got jobbed out, became one of the job squad guys in uh, WWF. And never really got any play, but ECW booked him very well. And in this, they have a, a pretty cool idea with, he teamed with Taz here, and I guess Taz had dropped the Tasmaniac gimmick by now, to go against the, the Pitbulls and Raven, Pitbulls and Raven, 
who had Beulah and Stevie in their corner, and Scorpio and Taz uh, went over. That's actually a pretty good tag team. If I were fantasy booking, you know, a fantasy uh, wrestling league or something like that, Taz and Two Cold Scorpio in this era is a, a pretty decent tag team. Uh, and again, they had Sandman and Cactus on top, barbed wire match. Uh, Sandman goes over again. Uh, again, I would have liked to see Cactus Jack maybe be the top guy in ECW at the time, but they didn't let that happen. Maybe he was a little too popular. Paulie liked pushing his local guys and stuff like that. Um, after that June 17th show, they did a show, you know, two weeks later that the Sandman versus Tommy Dreamer was the, uh, was the main event for. They don't have a Wikipedia article on it, and I wasn't there, so I can't really talk about it. But again, putting Sandman at the top of the card, Tommy Dreamer, that's, you know, two faces of the company battling it out. In July of 94, they had Hardcore Heaven uh, 95. And at Hardcore Heaven 95, uh, you see the Dudleys start coming into play. This is the first one this year that the Dudleys start coming in. They had Snot Dudley and Dudley Dudley, who are two lesser known Dudley boys. If uh, you only know Dudley boys from uh, WWF years and on, when they, you know when they finally went over to there. Back in the day, they had like you know 75 different Dudleys. They had Sign Guy Dudley, Big Dick Dudley, uh, Dudley Dudley, Dances with Dudley. Um, not just Bubba Ray and Devon, and then eventually Spike. Uh, but they beat the Pitbulls here. Um, a couple other guys, again, Dino Sendoff and Donnie Allen uh, and Chad Austin and the Broad Street Bully. They, you know, they had a match. I don't remember really any of those guys. They are, you know, probably more than likely underneath guys. Um, Two Gold Scorpio fights Taz at this next pay-per-view and beats him in a singles match, which is actually good. Again, that, that's another match that, you know, Taz with the master of suplexes and a little bit smaller guy, and but sturdy and strong, and Scorpio a little bit bigger of a guy but can flip and fly and stuff. That was, you know, those are very two good clashing styles, and I don't remember the match off the top of my head, but probably something worth checking out if you have the second. Um, you had Raven and Stevie Richards as the tag champions here. I was never a huge Stevie Richards fan. Um... But I know he's, he's got a great love of the business. I think he's still involved in the business. I mean, this was 1995, and I'm recording this in 2020. I think he still has something to do with the business, so it just goes to show you his you know, love and dedication. I know he went to EC, he ended up going to WCW, then WWF. Never really got any great uh, singles pushes, but it's nice to see him with uh, some sort of a title here. Sandman, again, fights Cactus Jack at this one. I... I understand the, uh, the concept of having to you know, do, like for example, nowadays WWF will have the same main event for a pay-per-view, three pay-per-views in a row. And you can see, obviously, they were still doing it in 1995. And I get it that you sort of have to push, um, you have to get all the mileage out of a match that you have. You can't just have a big, big build up, big build, and then one match, and then that's the end of it. You know, it makes, makes more money, draws more money that way. People want to, you know, pay money to go see those matches. But again, Sandman versus Cactus Jack, I think we just talked about it at the last three pay-per-views. Like, you know, I'm a fan, you know, it, it, I'm a fan of new matches, matches you've never seen before. Again, in 2020 now, they're talking about uh, Apollo Crews has been fighting the Hurt Business. Uh, every, every match Apollo Crews has had since June of this year, this is now uh, October, every match that Apollo Crews has had since June has been against somebody against the Hurt Business, and there's only like, you know, three guys in that. Like, switch the matches up. It's nice that people want to see fresh matches, even if there's not a lot of storyline. You know, I, I know a lot of people like me that even if it's just randomly two pairings together to see who's the bet, you know, if it's for a number one contender spot or who, you know, even a number two contender spot type thing, you know, it's nice to have fresh matches. And you can see here, they didn't have obviously tons, of, you know, a huge roster, but like, you know, again, they're killing us with this Sandman and Cactus Jack. And again, now you see Public Enemy against the, uh, the gangsters. The gangsters make their first appearance. Uh, on these super cards in 95 here. Gangsters were obviously very hugely, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, they were controversial. Um, New Jack obviously did a lot of things in the business that are, were not safe and not good for business. You know, he almost killed Vic Grimes, throwing him off a scaffold. You know, he bladed people too much. He cut the crap out of a 17 year old kid. Um, Probably not the nicest guy in the world. Probably, you know, he did a lot of the racist stuff when they were in Smoky Mountain. Uh, 
I don't know New Jack. He's probably, you know, he's probably an okay guy. Probably, you know, an okay guy to sit around with and have a beer, but definitely not somebody that I would have wanted to get mad in the back room or get mad in the ring because he was definitely going to take liberties with you. Okay, so after July of 95, that was July 1st, that Hardcore Heaven, we go into Heat Wave, which was July 15th of that year. So just, you know, again, another two, uh, two weeks later. You have, uh, again, Tony Stetson, Donnie Allen, Mike Norman. These are guys that nobody remembers uh, in the wrestling business, but on top of that, you also had guys like Raven and uh, Mikey Whipwreck. Snot Dudley, again, makes an appearance here. Um, he's still alive. He went by the ring name Anthony Michaels, too. I don't remember anything about Snot Dudley, but he was here um, with the other Dudleys, taking on the Pitbulls and Tommy Dreamer. Again, that's a fun match. Here you had Dean Malenko. Team. This is one of my favorite matches of all time. This is something that I can talk about. And if you had time, again, in watching this, you can see how much talent in, uh, is in this. Four guys that I was just talking about a couple minutes ago. Dean Malenko teaming with Two Cold Scorpio to take on Eddie Guerrero and Taz. Uh, Dean Malenko and Scorpio get the win here at 20 minutes. That is a, you know, that's a main event, in my opinion. It, you know, maybe not at a WWF level or even a WCW level at the time, but as far as work rate wise, if you put those four guys in a match together, they're gonna deliver. None, every single one of those guys probably never had a bad match. And uh, I love the teaming of Malenko and Scorpio. Again, that's a very cool fantasy league type uh, booking deal. And the same thing with Eddie Guerrero and Taz. When are you gonna see Eddie Guerrero and Taz uh, team up? That's one that I definitely uh, would say if you're gonna watch something, or if you're watching this ECW era, look for that match, that's huge. Um, again, they had Gangstas and Public Enemy uh, in the main event in the Steel Cage match. They relied very heavily on Public Enemy, you know, table spots and all that other stuff, and that was sort of what was getting them uh, on the market at the time, breaking tables, flaming tables, and stuff like that. Um, following that July, uh, 15th uh, heat wave in August we had Wrestlepalooza another super card again at the ECW arena um, you had uh, now we're starting to see the, in a six man match another great six man match again just the, the book it's very very smart booking as far as getting talent in a ring together to put a good match together Two Cold Scorpio Dean Malenko and Cactus Jack against Eddie Guerrero and the Steiner Brothers Again, that sounds like something that somebody, when you're playing a video game, makes, uh, you know, if you have a giant list of uh, created characters or unlockable wrestlers or whatever, Scorpio, Malenko, and Cactus Jack versus Eddie Guerrero and the Steiner Brothers is sort of like a dream fantasy match. It's a 22-minute match. Scorpio, Malenko, and Cactus Jack go over. That's another one. Again, Cactus Jack is sort of the odd man out there. And the Steiner brothers in ECW was a weird thing. They weren't there for very long. I don't think they got the ECW tag team titles either. Um, but definitely something worth watching. And uh, you don't really get a lot of great, great six-man tags, I guess, in America at least. But that's something to check out. You start, this is Mikey Whipwreck gets uh, the win over the Sandman here in a Singapore Kane match. This is when we're starting to see sort of Mikey Whipwreck, I think, going from that. Uh, he was one of the first guys to do that whole like loser that gets a win type gimmick, you know, that Barry Horowitz famously did in WCW or Eric Young, I think, did in TNA. Uh, you know, like the guy that never went or uh, Kurt Hawkins did, you know, they do that gimmick every once in a while. And that was good to see that. And again, you got um, Gangsters and Public Enemy in the main event. Again, you know, like we could switch the matchups here. It was a stretcher match, but um, you know, they could have, you know, something, you could have done something else, whatever. But again, just showing you the talent here. In September of 95, they had a super card called Gangsta's Paradise. Um, Bull Payne was in the opening match, who I know the name Bull Payne. He also went by Psycho or uh, Rick Ganter. Uh, I don't remember a lot about him, but you know, that's funny seeing him in the opener. Uh, the Eliminators come into play here. So you have Jason and the Eliminators uh, against Taz and the Steiner Brothers. Okay, let me repeat that. You had Taz and the Steiner Brothers as partners in a six-man tag match. Go and watch that. Those are three guys, probably the most legitimately tough, badass dudes um, in the company at the time or in pro wrestling at the time, and they ended up doing the job for Jason and the Eliminators. I love the Eliminators tag team. 
Uh, I love the look of them. I love the total elimination. I like Saturn and Cronus. That has something to do with like Greek uh, god or mytho mythology, something like that. I know that. Um, Cronus, I know, has passed away. Um, but was, uh, you know, I always thought he was a great looking, uh, gimmicky type guy. He probably could have went on. It was a very big martial arts kicks and stuff like that. Um, uh, you know, he was sort of reminiscent of like, uh, a mixture of like Canyon and like somebody that would have been in the DOA, uh, WWS DOA. But I love the Eliminators as a tag team. I always thought that they were great. And this is another one you see Rey Mysterio versus Psychosis. This is when, uh, Paulie was starting to bring in the dudes from Mexico. Paulie very responsible for bringing in, again, Rey Mysterio Jr., Psychosis, Chris Jericho, Dean Malenko, Eddie Guerrero, uh, all of those guys that went on to sort of make their name in ECW, make the jump to WCW, become stars in WCW, and then they're sort of the ones that jumped when Jericho uh, jumped to WWF. That was basically the start of the downfall for WCW. And then when guys like Benoit, Benoit, when Benoit, Malenko, Guerrero, when they start going over to WWF, that was the you know the absolute nail in the coffin for them. Uh, we'll skip the main event. You got a Gangsta's Paradise cage match with Mikey and the Public Enemy versus Two Cold Scorpio, New Jack, and the Sandman. Again, uh, probably not anything crazy to write home about, but still a nice uh, main event. And you can see that they were definitely relying heavily on those six-man tags at the time. Gangsta's Paradise was um, the next super card, which was held, or no, that was the one we just did, Gangsta's Paradise, yep. Um, November to remember of that year, so November of 1995. And now, again, remember, all of these matches and all of these super cards and stuff like that are just happening a couple of months uh, within, you know, from each other. So this is a lot of great talent, a lot of great matches to watch, a lot of good, uh, really talented superstars before they made it big or sort of in their prime and in their stride and stuff like that. So the, remember, the November to remember of 95, we see um, oh, Chubby Dudley, another Dudley that I forgot to talk about. He's in this. Uh, Conan makes his, uh, is making his uh, super card, I guess, debut uh, in the recent months, and he beats Jason. Um, it's good to see Conan, again, another guy that would jump ship very shortly to WCW and uh, make his thing there. He actually beats him, Jason in 14 seconds, which is funny. Um, they had Stevie Richards defeated El Puerto Ricano, who uh, you WWF people would know as Babu, uh, Pablo Marquez. That's just a funny gimmick to have him as El Puerto Ricano, the Puerto Rican. Um, you had Pitbulls versus the Eliminators uh, in a tag match. Again, that was when you're sort of getting away from the early uh, public enemy versus, you know, two other random guys or whatever. Now you're starting to see Pitbulls versus Eliminators. This was more hard-hitting, a little more violent, and uh, good matches. Pitbulls go over there. Again, we see Psychosis and Rey Mysterio in a Mexican death match this time, which is awesome. Those guys always put on a good show. Uh, I'm not sure if they had any five-star matches in ECW, but definitely had a lot of really good matches there. The, now, in the in the one of the mains here, they had a tag team match for the ECW Television Championship and the ECW World Tag Team Championship. The winner would become the number one contender for the ECW Heavyweight Championship. So you had Scorpio and the Sandman, who was the Television Championship, I guess. I, or no, they were the tag champions versus Public Enemy and uh, Scorpio and Sandman go over. It's kind of confusing uh, gimmick there, but uh, you know, or stipulations, whatever. But again, uh, Scorpio and Sandman, you know, two the top guys of the company. It's fun putting them together. Um, Mikey Whipwreck actually beats Steve Austin in this pay-per-view for the ECW. Well, Mikey Whipwreck was the champion at the time going into this. He beat Steve Austin. This was Steve Austin's like big, uh, big match in ECW. I don't think he did too too much as far as big Super Show um, matches there. And I know his feud with Mikey was one of the big one. And uh, he ends up losing, doesn't get the ECW title. Um, Terry Funk and Tommy Dreamer versus Raven and Cactus Jack as the main event. That's a good. Again, I'm not a huge Terry Funk fan. I know his legacy. I'm not a huge. Uh, 
I'm not a huge Raven fan. Again, I, I know his legacy and stuff like that. But those four guys, again, it's like a super car, a super uh, main event you have in all four top guys at the company. And then the dis, dis, December to Dismember in 95. So the December to Dismember, which was a month later of that, you're starting to see, um, let's see here. Raven beats Tommy Dreamer. Again, no big deal. That happened a lot. Sandman wins the world title back from Mikey Whipwreck in a three-way dance that also included Steve Austin. Again, so if you want to go back and see Steve Austin and his superstar Steve Austin days when he had been fired, I think like via telephone call or fax from WCW, but before he went on to become obviously Stone Cold and, and set the world on fire in WWF, this was his transitional point here. Uh, obviously never getting a big win on the supercars, but that's okay. We also had a, an Ultimate Jeopardy steel cage match. And this is probably where I'll stop here as far as just this, just this era of uh, section of time in 1995 for ECW. But Tommy Dreamer, the Public Enemy, and the Pitbulls going against Raven, the Heavenly, Body, the Heavenly Bodies, and the Eliminators. Um, you know, 10-man steel cage match, goes 21 minutes, uh, a lot of craziness going on, I guess, in that match, and the Heavenly Bodies are a little out of place there, whatever. Um, I know they probably didn't do a whole lot of ECW uh, stuff. This may have been the beginning of uh, the talent trade between WWF and ECW or Smoky Mountain and ECW. I know Smoky Mountain and WWF are working together, WWF and ECW were working uh, together around this time, so that was probably the beginning of that. So again, uh, ECW in 1995 was not a main stay, was not a national thing, did not have pay-per-views, basically was only running out of the same building uh, every week. But if you go back and you look at the talent that was there, all guys that would go on to become huge, huge stars around the world, um, and a lot, a lot of talent there. Again, I love watching Eddie Guerrero versus Dean Malenko. I love watching Two Cold Scorpio versus Eddie Guerrero and Two Cold Scorpio versus Dean Malenko. Um, and if you go and you watch these pay-per-views, um, there are these super cards and stuff like that, you're gonna see a lot of great matches like that, a lot of good chain wrestling. This was before really they started getting super duper over the top as far as like crucifying Sandman and New scaffold matches, like I said, with New Jack trying to kill people by throwing off the top of it. Um, but definitely not an era to sleep on. Definitely a lot of good talent. I was watching these shows uh, on local public access TV, like I said. I have very fond memories of it. And um, it, now it's very easily accessible on the WWE Network if you want to pop in. Like I said, starting around May of 95 was where I like to, you know, where I like to start. And you could just basically run all those shows in order and you're not going to find a bad thing. I think they probably have the hardcore TV maybe from around that time too, the weekly episodic EC show, uh, ECW shows that you can go watch that sort of tie into these super cards and stuff like that to see the build-ups and the blow-offs and stuff like that. Um, so check it out if you ever want to uh, check that out. It's not just, you know, not just Attitude Era. That's good wrestling to watch. Uh, you know, this is some good stuff. Some of my personal favorites is just my opinion. And um, again, if I can turn anybody on to some of these matches, more power to it. All right, again, I'm in my jammas. I'm in my garage. Thanks for watching. Like I said, I'll probably only get maybe two views out of this anyway. But use this information uh, wisely and as you should so see fit. All right, peace.